There's something huge in AI that I'm shocked more people aren't talking about, and I'll cut straight to it. Combining web scraping with AI, I think is a massive potential way to create apps that weren't possible before and compete with players with much bigger databases, more established, and also build value from scratch from the web and data transformations. Let's talk first about web scraping a little bit, then I'll get into how to do it correctly, not getting blocked, doing it at scale, thousands, tens of thousands of requests, what specifically to use, and then I will show you a few example apps I built in just about one hour each that I think already have potential to be, turn into like a B2B SaaS, maybe just as a feature. And you could probably just call them scripts at this point. They're not formalized with a database and so on. So web scripting is just a way to get data from the internet. But traditionally, there have been two big problems with scraping. Number one is scrapers are very brittle. They break often when websites change, which as we know, they do all the time. And then the other issue is if you have like multiple websites you wanna scrape, let's say you have a database of 100 companies and you want to get the same data from each website like what is their pricing what is their headline on their site their logo every page or every site's html is different so how do you actually deal with that it's a little bit difficult when it's not standardized so ai really solves these two issues because you can feed an llm unstructured data which is just any text input and most people aren't doing this, but it can give you a structured output like JSON that could be a row in your database, for example. And you can use this to build entire apps like directories. You can enrich current data. Like if you have a database of email leads, you can go to LinkedIn and find more info about people, then save that info. Or you can build this as a service, just build a huge database from scraping data and sell access to the API to companies. That's kind of the high level overview of why it's valuable because data is super valuable in general. Let's talk about scraping. Actually, how do you do it? Because it's not super difficult if you know a little bit of coding and we'll get into that now. So here's an easy way to understand scraping. I call it the levels of scraping. There's three. Let's start with level one, which is just making a request in your code to the URL. This is just going to return the markup or HTML of the page, which is not a great option because first, a lot of sites need JavaScript to even render the content. And second, you're not going to have any page interactions, so you're not going to be able to traverse, scroll, click on anything. Option number two, it is a lot better. It's headless browsing. And in fact, this is the bread and butter of your scraping. You run a library like Puppeteer in JavaScript, Selenium and Python, and basically your code is loading a browser environment and it's able to do everything you can do normally in a browser, which is incredible. You can click, take screenshots, scroll, and all the JavaScript will run, which is great. But there's one problem and it is that servers are smart. So if they see a lot of traffic coming from your IP address, your server IP address, or even if they detect this is an IP address, not of a person, but of a data center, your request can easily get blocked. And that is where proxies come in. Proxies give you a different IP for every request and you can actually get residential real IP addresses. So there's no way to tell that your scraper is a bot. It looks exactly like a real user. You can think of a proxy a bit like a VPN. It is going in between your headless browser and the requests it makes. And in this way, you can do parallel requests, a lot of requests back to back, and you don't have to worry about having problems with, for example, Instagram, if you're scraping different pages. But the big question is, how do you get a proxy? And most importantly, how do you get one with residential IPs? Well, shout out to Data Impulse for sponsoring this video. It's a great product that with only three lines of code allows you to run a proxy and it super easily integrates with Puppeteer, Selenium, etc. It's super affordable, 10 times cheaper than using a scraping service and you can set the locations of your IP addresses and similar. I just wanna show you the difference between scraping with a service like Apify compared to writing your own scraper and using a proxy. And the cost differences are actually quite substantial. So in this specific row here that you can see right here, you can see that I scraped a single profile with 15 reels. And this cost me basically three and a half cents to do. So that doesn't seem like a lot, but if you see all the requests I'm doing 
and I'm not even at a huge scale with my app, you can imagine this would get quite, quite expensive. Let's compare this to a data impulse where in this request, let's see, I have a bunch here that cost me nothing, but this one where I scraped a full profile, a real thumbnails and similar, it was four megabytes and that cost me 0.4 cents. So actually 10 times less to do my own scraper. Okay, so before I show you the first app that I've built, let's just look. And if we go to my plan, we can see all my credentials are right here. And I can easily get some starter code with the documentation or tutorials. And if I'm using like Puppeteer, it'll give me a full Puppeteer example I can start with, which is what I did for these uh, mini apps. You can set your specific countries. Sites can be different depending where you're visiting them from or be blocked. So that can be quite important. And then scrolling down, you can configure it further and also get more proxies if you need them. So with all that said, let's jump over to the code. This is the app that's scraping Instagram profiles and it's getting the stats from all the reels every day. So we can have kind of a time series view of how a given profile is changing over time. How many views are they getting? Or if you wanna look at a specific post that you collaborated on, for example, you can see how that post is doing. So let's just run through things like pretty quick and I'll do it in blocks. Here, we're just setting up our proxy chain, which is our basically loop of proxies we're gonna go through with our data impulse credentials. And these are basically copied from the documentation. Going down, I can do multiple usernames. And then basically here we've got tech with Tim's Instagram. And then we are mapping those into an array of URLs. Uh, going down, we're here launching our scraper puppeteer in headless mode false for development. That'll just show what the scraper is doing so we can see it, debug it. But in production, you turn this to headless true. And then just scraping code here. Long story short, we're opening the page, waiting for it to load, waiting for a specific element on the page because it can load in pieces. And then we are selecting the whole header. Let me uh, show you what that looks like on Instagram and how I like kind of determine which element to select. So if I go to console here, I can just do the uh, selector on this element and we can see it is the header type element. So of course you can feed in the whole page markup, but I think header is pretty reliably still gonna be there. Of course it can still break, but this is like a container element rather than a class. So I'm feeling more confident about that. So back over here, we're selecting that entire header and then saving header content in this variable, all the HTML. And then we are uh, looking at the reels one at a time because I'm actually going to the uh, reels page. I, I don't have reels personally, but there's a tab here. So if we go to like tech with Tim, and then this is a uh, standardized sort of URL structure, username slash reels, it's going to this page, which you'll see when we run the scraper. Uh, then it's pulling all these stats. So we can see right here, we're displaying likes, comments, and views. So that'll be saved. We're actually explicitly selecting each real container with the, the URL that it links to. So there's unique URLs on each one of these cards. But I mainly wanted to show you this down here, analyze header. So we're running this code I have in a different file, analyze header, which is our API call to OpenAI. And here's my prompt. I'm just saying, here's some HTML. Please give it to me back in this structure, followers, following link, and bio. And then with the response, we are doing a little bit of code on it because I noticed often with OpenAI, they return like the markdown format JSON. So with the three back ticks and then we're JSON. So we're just replacing that with empty string. And then even if it fails, we're just running the prompt again one time and then it can still fail after that, in which case you'd want to have like a fallback uh, strategy for this. So that is the long and short of the code. Let's actually run this and hopefully it works. So we're just running node on our main JS and we're running in headless false. So we can see the page come up and there it is. And we can see that everything printed. So here we got followers, 23K, following 212, bio, and then the link. And then of course we have stats on each reel and the URL. So of course there's a lot more we can do with this. We can download videos. We can monitor for changes. Like when do they post a new reel? And then of course we can just do this time series statistics tracking as like a business insight. All right, next one, I'll run through this one really fast, I promise. 
because the setup is pretty similar. We are comparing screenshots every day on a given website that we feed in. We can have a hundred, a thousand of these websites and just visit them once every day, take a screenshot, compare it to the screenshot from yesterday, and then AI will tell us, did the website change? If so, what changed? Then you can make a prompt more specific. Tell me if the price changed. Tell me if the headline changed, ETC. Okay, so running through the file, we have this code that is saving, it's generating a file name for each URL. Then we have our standard proxy setup, starting proxy, and then we are reading that local file to see if it exists. If not, we just take the screenshot, we do the first comparison tomorrow. We're launching Puppeteer, again, headless false for example purposes, and then waiting for the page to load, taking screenshots super easy with this method in Puppeteer, and importantly, we're saving it into memory so we can feed it into OpenAI through the API. Now, closing the browser, closing the proxy, and then we're running this compare images code, which I have written here. Just tell me what's the difference between these two images. It's a starter prompt that can be further modified. We're feeding in the two images in base64. That is just string format. We'll get back the response. And then we have some checks here for varying response types. Um, we can modify that further for more reliability. And then, yeah, just returning the result and printing it. Are we printing it? Yeah, we're printing it. Okay, let's run this one and see if it works. So here's the Freemo website. Didn't find an image, so we saved it. Now let's run it again to see the comparison. It's gonna be the same, but let's just see what happens. Change is false, save the new file. So we're all set. And once again, can run this daily, thousands of companies, monitor for changes, could be a cool app. This a kernel could be modified to something even more interesting, powerful, et cetera. Okay guys, that is what I wanted to share in this video. If you haven't had your AI home run app yet, hopefully this can give you some inspiration, maybe to add to what you're working on, maybe just to do a side project. But me personally, I think this is really cool. Gotta use the proxy if you're doing things seriously. And uh, Data Impulse, I actually do use them as well as you know working with them on this video. So I hope you saw how easy uh, it was. And yeah, just a couple lines of code to get set up less than a cent per full page load. So pretty good. Last thing I wanna say, and if you're sharp, maybe you caught on to this. So when you're feeding a lot of requests into AI, you're probably thinking, wow, that's gotta get pretty expensive if you're actually doing enterprise scraping scale to create like a million row database. And that's very true. But I have a very interesting video in the works for you running models on your laptop locally. So even if you have a production app, as long as your computer is on, you know, at a specified time, then you can run things locally on your machine and save hundreds, thousands of dollars on open AI billing. And I think this is an amazing use case for a local LLM. So I'm gonna show you how to uh, do that in the next video. I hope you'll stick around and maybe subscribe if you made it to the end and catch you guys in the next one.